All right, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, so last time we talked about, we, we have a very brief introduction to the support vector machine. And after we talked about uh, feed forward network from perceptron to multi-layer perceptrons. So as we mentioned last time, uh, the problem with solving this support vector machine is to solve a optimization problem. So first, let's give me give you a very simple example. So we so have intuitive understanding. So how you can have uh, the sort of Lagrange do problem, right? So let's consider a simple case. Suppose we want to uh, this is a log Lagrange duality. So suppose we want to minimize the function. Uh, this is quite a, a, a primal problem. So that's the problem we start with. Is to say minimize f x. So x is a is a vector, right? So the function, of course, it had to be a scalar. So we minimize this function subject to a constraint. The constraint is a, it's a scalar function, Gx. So this one is a, not a positive. Let's right. just say we start with this, this, this problem. It's a very constraint optimization problem. So this problem turned out to be equivalent under general condition uh, to the dual problem. The dual problem is to, so the minimum become maximized. Uh, this function we define as a, it's, it's like a log launch multiplier. So this is a, a lower bound. So so the x belong to to some so in the say the x belongs to some some region in, in space, right? This is a some n dimensional space. So so among all x you define this function. This is the original function I want to optimize times your multiplier times your constraint, right? This is, this is a Lagrange multiplier, like this, you have an original function with this constraint, like this. So here we define a new, a new function, right? It, it, it is based on this, but you try to find the x, try to minimize this function. So what's left is only the multiplier is left, right? The x is gone. You find x that minimizes this whole thing. So the, your function is dependent on this, uh, dependent on this multiplier only. So it turns out this problem, you maximize this subject to the constraint. So this constraint, uh, this CL lambda is non-negative. This, these two problems are closely related. In many cases, they're actually equivalent. Right? So now I'll just show you, this is a, uh, I'll show you uh, why, why this, should be, this should be the same. So this is a very intuitive argument. So we start with like a, a, like a ge geometric, uh, geometric picture. Suppose uh, we start from the space of your variable. This is, I say, this is a x1. X2, so if I just draw a three dimensional, it could be higher dimension. So the point in there is uh, the x, right? We start with this x. So of course this x is within some region in space. This is a capital X. It's all possible values that's allowed, all right? So now let's map this point here, this x, to a new space here. So let us draw uh, this space, we call this, uh, so this is two-dimensional, this is y, say is equal to the y, the horizontal axis is equal to the constraint. 
uh, the vertical axis, according to z, is equal to uh, the original function you want to optimize. All right. So any point in x, you map to some point here in this space. All right. Of course, the whole space of x is mapped to, to something, maybe this, let's just draw this, something like this. All right. This is going to say, okay, this is big Y. So every point here is a matter somewhere here. So we want to find the location where uh, this function, let me have it draw, draw better. Oops. Okay, here. Let's draw a big one. So, so we want to find uh, our constraint here means that this y equal to j is negative. So I mean, we only so the, so the, what we want to consider space on the left side of this axis, right? So we want to find a location where this variable, this f x, is the smallest, which means we should go down here. If we draw a horizontal line that just touch this boundary of my image, is y. Right, this location would be this location would be the this is the, this is the solution, right? So you find whatever x the projectile here, maybe somewhere, I don't know where, to this location, this makes the f function smallest, right? And also satisfies the concentration, it means this, this g, uh, this y here, has to be negative, right? Of course, there could be other cases, like so this is one, so it could be the, the solution could be on the boundary. For example, if you say I draw this thing again, if this area y, if uh, it goes this way, for example, we consider the left side of the case, right? Uh, you see, in this case, the smallest vertical, this, this fx here, the smallest value is actually on the boundary, right? Because it had to be negative, non-positive. So this is lowest one here. Even though they're lower here, but that's that 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 does not satisfy the constraint. Right? All right. So this is a uh, this is the original problem. So how is that equivalent to this dual problem? The dual problem looks like more complicated, but why that you want to do that will become clear. That sometimes you solve the dual problem actually it's a, it's actually easier. Even though it looks more complex here, but actually it is easier when you do computation. So let's show what does that mean. So this function here, let's say, uh, if I have to draw another diagram here. So if I draw here, suppose I draw a line in this y z space, a straight line like this. So this line, of course, it is. Uh, let's call this line uh, so f is equal to z plus lambda y. Uh, equal to a constant. So this is a <coughs> this is a straight line, right? This two variable equal to some constant. Now, of course, the slope of this line here, the slope uh, equal to you have to move this lambda y to the right hand side. So the slope is negative of lambda, right? So your lambda you're required to be positive, right? So this way, this has to be slanted this way. Um, so this z plus Lambda y, you see, it is exactly the same as this. Right? So it's fx times rg y. Right? It's the same thing as this. <coughs> so we try to minimize this whole thing here. It, it's as if you're trying to minimize this c, right? <coughs> because this is the same as a fx, just by definition. So the c in this line, it is. The slope is minus lambda. The intersect with the vertical axis, so the axis is this here. This is a c, right? It's intersect when y equals to zero, then z equal to c. All right, so the, the function we define here is a function of, of the lambda only, is to try to find the x or to make the whole thing smaller. That means just we try to find the, the, okay, the lambda is fixed, right? For lambda fixed, you basically have these lines with the same slope. You try to find some x inside the y. Somehow it makes uh, the value the smallest, right? This, uh, uh, 
you uh, you make you make the make the make the C the smallest, and then you make the intersect as low as possible. So this is possible only if you were over here touching the boundary. Right? It's a tangent curve touching the boundary here. This is the lowest possible C. Right? All right. So that's you define the function of lambda is just this. this <coughs> The value is equal to the intersect on the y-axis. That is the smallest value that's possible, which is right here. So the next step is that you maximize this function. As you maximize this function, you maximize this function. So it's here that you see amount. Let me draw another curve here. Um, so oh, to draw better, easier to see. Uh, oops. So you give me any slope, this lambda, right? I can draw a line. I, f I find some c. If you give me another one, I can draw another one, right? I can have another one, so on. So because the slope I require it to be um, the lambda itself is positive, greater or equal to zero. So when this is a, this is a <coughs> when this is a horizontal, that this c you see the value is actually the highest possible value you can get. C, right? So all the lines it touches this curve, that's the, all the tangent curves. So this you see when this gets become this one with the lambda equal to zero, that this c value that intersect is the highest. So that means that you see that you compare with what it gets before. Uh, it is here, it's a horizontal line that touches this. That's the lowest value you can get, right? If you do this curve, that, that a tangent curve, then the intersect is the highest when you move on, when you become a horizontal, right? Then you, you recover the same, the same points, right? <coughs> so that means you optimize these two different problems you get the this, this, this same final solution. So in this case, we do this case. It's if you if this point here is at the boundary of your constraint, uh, you get the same result. So I think uh, in this case, you uh, also have you draw a straight line. Oh my gosh, it had to be very precise. In this case, you do the same thing. You draw a straight line. <coughs> this is the point with the lowest. Uh, you, with the different slope, you find the, the tangent point, right? But when you go through here, you see that you, even though the value here may be lower, but you, because you have this constraint, right? You have to, so the. The highest you can go is right here. Right. So, that's, so that means whether the point is not in the boundary of the country or on the boundary country, you use the same, you optimize the same function here to get the same results. Right. It's all, 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 it's all consistent. Right. So of course you see this argument of though this is very intuitive. You see, if you make it rigorous, I think the problem is that you have to assume this side is convex. If you have a stuff that look like a little thing inside, that you may get into trouble. Right. So that means is when you do this optimization, it really emphasizes com com convexity. That means you have two points in the set, you connect them, the, the line segment is always inside the set. So that makes com uh, optimization much easier. Right? All right, so this is the intuitive explanation with the dual problem, right? the, the, the duality. <coughs> so, so for support of vector machine, um, what we need, uh, let me just see what's the sort of writing machine problem. In general, uh, let me see this. Uh, we want to we remember to relax time. So for super vector machine, you have this problem of classification. You, you can mean data points like these. You want to, uh, so that the data is uh, um, you have x1, x, and 
So this this is a, each of this x is a vector, as right? a data vector. But because we don't we, the subsquared one is a, is a number, is it is the first one, second data set, so that's a vector. It's not a component, right? Because here I cannot draw it, but just just remember it's a vector. And this is the output, the correct output, the labeling. So this y uh, equal to plus one or minus one, which belong to two different classes. So each point is one x uh, i in the each the, the data has a label so it's belong to class one or class two with a positive or negative. So we want to, as you remember last time, we want to find a decision boundary. This is basically a linear discriminant, right? This is your, your y output uh, is equal to some vector w times x plus b. It's a linear, it's a linear discriminant function. What we say is a, like a simple perceptron. But the trick is that you find a decision boundary which corresponds to this function w x plus b equal to zero. Suppose your weight vectors go this way, then when you have a parallel line or parallel plane in general, uh, this would be, you want, you want this value equal to the one when, when it touches this vector, right? It's on the border. So when you go the other way, this thing equal to minus one. Of course, all the data points on the horizontal lines, the parallel with your decision plane, they all have the same value. For example, this one equal to two, this one equal to three, right? This parallel plane is equal to minus two and so on, right? <coughs> so the decision boundary is that your linear discriminant equal to zero. So it is positive on the side of the vector of your world, with your weight vector negative on the other side. <coughs> so, <coughs> So the margin here, as we said last time, this is equal to one over the norm of that vector, the weight vector. So the optimization problem here is that you want to maximize the margin so one over this, or maximize this one over this, right? And the constraint is that your classification should be correct. Right? So subject to, so that means this W X I plus B it should be greater or equal than one if this yi is belong to one to one class. And the same thing should be negative greater than minus one if this one belongs to the second class. Right? So this is a problem we, we, we want to solve. So this will solve the problem. Uh, eventually this end up to be a, a quadratic uh, program problem. To solve problem, we use the the, 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 the the duality principle we just we just mentioned. Let me show you how this works, right? So <coughs> we can write this we can write these things slightly differently. Let me just say we really want to do is to is the equivalent to minimize. So this is our primal problem, all right? Minimize. This weight vector, right? Uh, because this is the same as maximize this. So subject to the, the two different conditions, I can write it together. Because because my y you could do plus or minus one. You can say this y i times this function itself. Oh, y, right? So negative case is also also correct. <coughs> so this is the optimization problem. All right. <coughs> So the one thing is that, wait, why don't you just like, you know, use like a, 
log long multiplier, like the, you know, the intuitive idea, but why don't you use, uh, say, a defined function, a multiplier fun uh, a functional, is equal to maybe I minimize this. It could be like square, but it's easier. Right? Maybe sometimes you add one half. Uh, plus, you have maybe things like this. So multiplier, I add these, all these functions like this. Add them all together. Minus one. So it becomes zero, all right? All right. Why not just try to optimize some function like this? Oh, right. well, you can do this, but the problem is if you, if you, you know, this is standard log log multiplier method. So if you do this, uh, of course, this is a some function. Then you set it to zero. Then you, you solve, you solve, you solve, the, solve, the, solve, the, solve the problem. But the problem is when you do the derivative, you see here, this function, it depends on the weights, right? And your b is your bias. But also depend on the multiplier of the lambda, which all of them are unknown. Right? We saw the problem; it's not, it's not that easy in general. Right? Even though it's, it's, you look at here, if I do this, this is a linear function. I can solve. I can solve it very easily. But the problem is this trick here is this thing here. Right? You have this constraint here. Otherwise, you, you only solve this problem. If you don't have a constraint, it's easy. This is just you make a derivative, you get a linear function of a w, and you solve for w. But the problem that is of course the lambda is not solved either. Right? <coughs> But if you do, if you consider that 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 do problem, actually the problem is actually easier to solve. So the do problem and write down look like this. <coughs> For this particular case, right? It's not always <laughs> the do problem. Is that we define this. Um, we define a function that depends on uh, <coughs> on the lambdas. Uh, the minimal value, not all the w, uh, and also you have another parameter that's b, right? The b is kind of like weights we said before. Um, so the pr so you're just saying just a um, w one half. It's uh, I just copy down the same thing. And you sum over all the i. All right. Um. Yeah, so here, this, this one half, this doesn't really matter here, right? Let me see, where is my, yeah. Uh, you, if you don't use it, when you would to the square term, you make it one half, it's, it's slightly easier, but if you use that, fine, that, that works too. So the negative sign also doesn't matter, because it all can be absorbed with, the, with multiply. But here, you use this one, just want to be consistent with what we use here in the beginning. Uh, you, 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 your <coughs> constraint function is, is a negative, or, or, or zero. In this case, it would be correspond to all these things here, right? Negative sign and you know, one minus the sign is negative. So that's just <coughs> all right. This this is a due problem. It looks complicated, but once you plug it in, you can, you can solve for this. It turns out it's not that hard. It, it become kind of it's a, become a quadratic program problem, which has has mature solutions. All right. So it's okay so far. Any any questions so far? It's okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> All right, to, to solve for this, the first one for this function inside here, we just make, try to first, we, <coughs> we already uh, try to find you here, this, this x, for example, we, the x we used before is a, is a variable. Now the variable is a w and a b, all right? But that, that's the variable we want, we want to <coughs> optimize. So, <coughs> In this case, uh, we first find the w and the b to make uh, this function or this, this, the, 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 the find the minimum of the value, and then the next step you optimize the lambda. Right. 
to find the smallest value, uh, we use this, this, the same method. This is the, this is the <coughs> sorry. We use this, uh, let's call this thing here, we'll call this capital L, right? depend on W, B, and lambda, right? The y and x, that's a, that's a data, that's how they are fixed. So now, if we do this, we'll make a derivative of this function. Uh, with respect to w, what you get is, this is a quadratic term, you become a linear term in w, right? Uh, so this one, let me see, uh, yeah. You get lambda i, y i, uh, with respect to w, you get only x left, all right. Um, so this should equal to zero. So this is a necessary condition for optimal s solution, right? If you make a second derivative, you can check that you make second derivative, so the second derivative, uh, That become a matrix, right? This this is become identity matrix. So this is a positive definite. That means a solution like this, or this is a minimum. There's really a minimal solution. So the solution is W. So from here you to get W is equal to all right. So you see, your, your weight vector turns out to be a linear combination, so lead scalar, linear combination of your input data, right? <coughs> and these are output. So uh, we also need to, another variable we want to optimize is the relative to the, 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 the by. The by is sort of like a weight, right? We make a derivative, say the result should be, uh, equal to zero. All right. So these, these kind of, st based on this necessary condition, we, we got these results. The weight should look like that as a solution. But, all right. And this will also equal to zero. Right. So this type of condition usually called uh, Kuhn and Tucker, you will see Tucker conditions. Right? So basically, you optimize some function, you make the derivative equal to zero. It's a necessary condition for that opti optimal point to, to exist. All right. So, <clears throat> so now, you see, you, you, you expressed uh, this your W like this, right? Uh, in terms of your, 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 your data, now you plug, plug it in here. So these are, this is the, the, the minimal solution for, for this function now. You plug it in and see what this function this actually looks like, right? It just goes into here. So this function. Um, yeah. So you see this, the first one is this W, all right? The W should, should be like this. So <coughs> we just do, so this W, Itself, right? So what you got is this: this uh, i and the j, because all these terms, all the cross terms should really exist: lambda i, lambda j, y i, y j. So x i transpose x j. Right? It's a scalar. So that's basically this the square of the norm. Plus, and it was the second term, uh, minus, uh, yeah. So, <coughs> yeah, 
Yeah. So, so here, sorry, here, just I, I, I missed one thing. So when, when you derivative relative to B, relative to B here, uh, this is lambda, but there's also a term of Y, right? The Y is your times B, right? So this is like this. There's no lambda as Y, I like this, yeah. It's better. All right, so we just plug, plug this Y, plug in, plug in this, plug in this thing, right? Let's see what it is. So the first term, that's similar to what we had before. Lambda, Y, X, this W. So the result is the same as this. It's minus... Uh, J, Y, I, Y, J, X, I, X, J. So when you plug this W in here, and the second term is a uh, third term. So minus, minus lambda Y, B, that's right, yeah. And then plus, Plus lambda i. That's right. So this one we said this one should equal to zero because we said the condition we derived so it should be zero. So these two terms, the first one and the second one, they are the same, right? <coughs> Except this one half. So finally we f we find that <coughs> this error function. So basically we just our object our final optimization problem is to maximize Maximize this error lambda, which equals to lambda i uh, minus one half. You sum over all possible i and the j, so basically all possible pairs uh, of the product. It's lambda i, lambda j, y i, y j, x i transpose times x j. And your country here is subject to lambda i greater than zero. i equal to one, two, three, or whatever you say. So this is the final thing we derive. For the support vector machine, so the optimal problem equivalent to this. Right, that's just based on that this is this is a due problem we get. So look at this problem. Uh, it's easier to solve because you see. We only have the unknown variable is only lambda, the, or the multiple layers, right? So the x, y is all the data that's all, it's all, it's already given. Which is from here, it just constrain this lambda to be positive or non negative, right? So you see, for this, this function itself, for lambda, it's only a quadratic function. The lambda, uh, sorry, this is a, I need to write this better. This is a, it's not x, this is a lambda, just to be. Lambda i, lambda j. These x, y here are all data. So you see, this is a quadratic function of lambda, right? subject to this constraint. So the, the, the method to solve the problem is called quadratic programming. So basically, it's optimized a quadratic function uh, subject to some linear constraint, right, of some variable. So, the f so this is a, uh, there, there are standard solutions. There, there, there are different ways to solve this. There are standard solutions. Right? You can, there are many different packages available you can use very easily. Right? So this is like a mature problem. So now we just converted this uh, super vector machine to, to, this, to this problem. Right? So this can, this can, it can be solved. So what the solution looks like? The solution we just said, just we said before, what you get, once you say you solve this lambda, then your weight vector now equals to that, to, to this i lambda y i x i. So I realize, so, so sorry, let me just write this better. So it turns out for this solution, uh, because if you don't have the, this constraint, this, 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 uh, 
<coughs> lambda greater than zero. If you only have the corrective function, this, this optimization is very easy, right? The corrective function always has a unique solution, right? It has a single peak or, 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 or valley. Then you take a derivative, it's a linear equation, you can solve it immediately. But the, the, the trick is that you have this constraint here. The constraint is that because of the constraint, it turns out the problem tend to be, the solution tend to be out at the boundary. So in fact, when you solve this, this problem for the super vector machine, right, you have this, right? You solve for the weights, and it turns out this weights, most of this WI, a lot of them are actually equal to zero. Some of them maybe not equal to zero. For the ones it's not equal to zero, that's a support vector. But you, you look at the look at the weights, right? The weights depend on the data, right? For support vector that when you do this find the maximum margin classifier, so most data don't matter. You see, look at this. So you suppose this this is a decision boundary here. Of course the boundary you want to maximum away from all the data points. Actually what matters really is these points here, right? You can have more data point here, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't affect my boundary. My boundary is only determined by the thing that's close to the border, close to my decision boundary. So when you do the solution, your weight vector, it depends on the data, it turns out most of the data don't, do not depend on it at all. Only the one that's, that's this lambda not equal to zero actually accounted for, so that these are actually the support vectors. These is not equal to zero, these correspond to the support vectors. That's called support vectors. So the data is far away, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't contribute for anything. So the, 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 the deeper question about this is that when you do the classification, right, there's uh, at least two different ideas. So one standard idea is that you want to say, okay, this is we do a, say, we, it's like, a di like a diagnosis of a disease. We get some measurement of some, some data and just say, well, over here, the, above this, uh, these are the people as a positive. Other side is negative, right? So how do you do the classification? So one method is that I find a sort of a typical, like a positive person. I mean, I said like a stereotypical, like a, like a prototype, someone like a very typical. Say this person suppose is here, right? Okay, here. I have another typical negative person, like a like healthy person. I suppose this is one. I put it here. You give me a data point somewhere, right? I just compute the distance to my typical. You know, sick person or typical healthy person and see which the distance is smaller. If it's closer to the healthy person, I say it's healthy, right? Closer to the bad person, I say that, that's, that, that has positive. So this is one idea, you're like a prototype. May, maybe human actually use this method if you compare with some of your stereotype, stereotypical case, which, which one is closer. But the support vector actually, the philosophy is actually different. Right? They ignore this thing, the prototype. They, they only find this thing that's atypical. This is like a borderline cases. <laughs> so you see the, 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 the thing that affects your decision boundary are only the ones who are identified the positive, but you know, sort of like a normal, right? And these ones are sort of healthy, but almost sick, right? <laughs> you only pick those borderline cases, and those things will completely determine your decision boundary. The things far away, like a typical case, they, they don't matter at all, right? So that's, of course, the intuitively you think this would be, you have the maximum mar like a margin, then you have better generalization. <coughs> All right, so, so when you do this, you see that you solve, just solve this, this quadratic program problem, given the data set. The, the solution, actually, most of these multiplier lambda are going to be zero. So there's only a few here that actually matters. That's just a perfect vector. Right? And so what about that B? The B, because, uh, when you do the classification, right, this, the, the, the point on the boundary, you have this y times this, you remember this, your y is plus one minus one times b. This one is always equal to one, right? So if the far away is greater than, than, than one. Uh, for this point, of course, you, you have the data point, xi and yi, the w, you, you already know like that, and you can solve for b from this, right? The b is soft. So the whole, the whole problem is solved like this. Uh, so in, in your homework, I will ask you to do an uh, actual problem. You just do the pro pro uh, classic program to, to solve an uh, actual problem. All right, so this is the, this is the solution. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, so 
when the thetas are overlapping yeah. with each other, what's the intuition yeah. for that? Okay, so for that, in that case, uh, this cannot solve the problem. So, so just as you said, if there is one, uh, say, data point over here, there's an, it's not it's linearly linearly in, like, in, inseparable. Right? For the standard thing, you cannot solve. This you can solve only if there is a decision boundary you can put in half. But there is another method that's ba based on the same problem called the soft margin. It's a generalization. It's a very easy generalization. It turns out the problem is still quadratic programming. So soft margin, so the method is like this. So you define a, a slack variable. So the idea is that, uh, say so you do, I still draw the same thing, okay. Uh, so the, this is your support, suppose you be like this, start from here. So decision boundary WB, uh, w, sorry, WX plus B equal to zero. So that's plus one. The other curve says minus one. You have some support vectors here. So suppose <coughs> you're, you have data point like say here inside. So, so, so basically this you can, so the generalization of soft margin is that you have a, your data points are almost like a two different class can be linearly separable. Maybe there are a few so outliers that can be across the boundary, right? If the things are completely overlapping, that you better use a probabilistic method. <laughs> but you're going to be, have a lot of error anyway, right? But this way, if you have a few, uh, not that many, so the message is like this. You define another variable, uh, it's called a slack variable. So it's basically you define this uh, this variable. Let's say it's an epsilon i. It, it's uh, this this means this is a, it's a correct classification, but you are inside this margin. This is the plus or minus margin that we said before. Right? You are, you're inside. So this distance you call this epsilon. Right? If epsilon is uh, greater than one, that's the wrong classification. You, cr you cross border over here as well. So <coughs> if, you, if you add this variable, then uh, your optimization problem becomes um, <coughs> you, <coughs> you minimize, we, we said we, we, in the path we minimize the weights, right? Like this. Now you plus another term, uh, all your select variables. Of course, your these variables are all, uh, equal to zero, right? Um, subject to so you have this equation we had before. Uh, B uh, is greater or equal than one, right? In the case, but here it's just like this. Add another thing, right? To so say if I, it's not you know the, the border here it won't work, but you have to shift a little bit, right? To make the margin smaller, and then this should, should, should be okay. If you allow the margin, so that, so this this in this this formalism, there is one only free parameter is here. So if the parameter equal to zero, that's the same as we had before. Right? We just like uh, optimize the margin, right? But in this case, uh, you have this <coughs> this slack variable. You want to make it as small as possible. Right? Just find a small, uh, and this looks sort of like a balance between the big margin versus like you want to be. Uh, <clears throat> you, want the, you want the margin to be big, at the same time, you don't want to too many cells across the border. Right? So that this is sort of a variable, you, it's you, you, you set the variable. So sort of you, you, you balance the margin versus how many errors, how, how many error you allow. And then the constraints look like that. So then you do the same thing again. So you see the stuff like there, you just have a linear term relative to this, right? You, 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 and, and over here, you have another linear term, right? So the total problem that you optimize in the past, we try to find, try to find W and the B. Right now, you have also uh, sorry, sorry. So when for the so you first find W B is the same as before. But when you get that function, in the past we just have a, a function de depend on lambda only. Now we have lambda also depend on epsilon. 
right? You add one trouble. Then you do optimization, you, you optimize relative to lambda and, and epsilon. Epsilon also, because, because here where the pairs are linear, so the, the final problem is still, op it's, it's, it is still a quadratic pro program problem. It doesn't change the nature problem. It can, still can be solved with a unique solution. All right. <coughs> So <clears throat> this method, look at it, it's very, um, it is a, it's, a, it's a linear discriminant, right? Try to, try to maximize the margin. It seems like it makes sense. And in practically, it, it works very well. Um, but it's very limited right? because it's, a, it's a, after all, it's a linear discriminant, right? Uh, there's a, another thing that causes a, a, a kernel trick. Uh, it's, it, it can generate into nonlinear space. It makes it much more versatile. So the idea is this. Uh, let's start with, uh, with a problem like this. Suppose we have problem uh, so x1, x2. Suppose the two classes, my data set look like that, linearly inseparable. So this support vector machine won't, won't work, right? This, this is the, 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 the linear one won't work. But if you make a transformation and translates into a polar coordinate system, this is this radius and the angle, right? All these dots, the, the circle one, the, the radius is smaller. You, you get this thing like this, right? The other one is like that. So you just make a transformation in a new space. Uh, this problem is linearly separable. <coughs> I'll give you more examples. Uh, So this is the this is the one one example. So another method, for example, you can use this. For example, the same the same problem. Let's have a different mapping. Instead of I map in just from two-dimensional space to another two-dimensional space, I change the corner system. But suppose I make it into a higher dimension. So there's the one standard trick people use a lot. So you can do the discrimination. It's it's actually helpful to go to higher dimension. It makes things easier. So Suppose I make it this three dimensions. So this is, a, say, x1, x2, the same. I add another variable, like x3. x3, suppose this is equal to, say, x1 square plus x2 square. So what this, what this is, is a, this is a quadratic function. It's like a bow like this, right? So all the data points now map on the surface of this plane, uh, of this uh, of, uh, surface of so this Smaller point would be here, and that cross would be uh, the x would be somewhere here. So in a, in a, in a, because this <coughs> this in this three dimensional space, it's easier to it's a, it's a problem with linear separable. You can have a horizontal plane like this that should be separate to so class very easily. You can do another one. I gave you a third example. This is more standard. Like you use uh, three-dimensional space like this. So uh, this is x1 square, x2 square. So it's a qu quadratic function. So x1 times x2. So that's also you get some kind of surface. I, it's hard to draw, but the data points once again, it's a, it's. Most of it's, it's a separable in the high dimensional space. So you say, oh, this is just like a, like a trick, right? It's, it's always possible. It turns out there's a theorem called the uh, cover theorem. It basically, it's always possible. Theorem. So basically, what it says is that, uh, so for, for classification for you know, two different type of data points, right, in, uh, in any space, 
you can always have a high in a high dimension. It's a, it's always the problem always become linearly separable in a high enough space in a high enough dimensional space. Well, okay. Let, let, let's look at this. Suppose you have a, you have you have, you have a three points. Have a three point. If they are lined on a, on a line, say this is the one point. There's another point. There's another point like this, right? In a one dimensional problem, it's not it's not separable. You cannot I cannot use this point to separate them. But if you map it to higher dimensional, like say this is a cur like a quadratic curve like this, right? It becomes separable, right? So then in general, in a, in a two-dimensional uh, plane, right, you have a three points. Suppose you have a three points. Uh, you, they are not on the same line. So no matter what the classification is, these two that become the same class, they are two class, they're always linear separable, all right? So if you have a four points, then I consider a three-dimensional three space. Already we said before, on this plane, the three points are always linear separable. We can always have a line separate them, right? I have a third point, it's all, uh, so, uh, so a fourth point that gets it out of this plane. I say it's here. It could be this or it could be that. No matter which way, I can always move my plane in the high dimensional to make that one classify in the correct way. All right. So that means you do this by induction. So you always have a simplex. Right? This, is a, uh, this is a tetrahedron right? for four points. You have any point, and any point, you can always map it to a high dimensional space in a uh, maybe nonlinear mapping somehow on the vertices of some uh, simplex in the high dimensional space. So in that case, always, a anything you can al always use a plane to, 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 to separate some. All right. <coughs> All right. Uh, let's give you another example. Uh, solve this XOR problem. The standard with multilayer perception, you need to add, add some hidden unit. You can add a one, you can add a two, there are many different solutions. You can add a one, there are also many different solutions. It's kind of interesting to look at. But for support vector machine, if you use this nonlinear mapping, you can solve the problem. So let me give you one example. There are multiple examples. Let's say, suppose you start from here. Uh, uh, Let's say this is x1, this is x2. Uh, let's make the problem plus or minus. Let's make it easier. You can, the old one is a problem, 0 and the 1. The plus or minus is the same, right? So not it's plus 1, it's minus 1. So the two class of point, one is here. Uh, so this is here. Yeah, so not, not linear separable. So if you do a linear, you do a nonlinear mapping this way. So this one is still x1. So this vertical axis now becomes x1 times x2. So for these two points, uh, so the x1 is plus 1, so it's, it doesn't change, it's still the same. But the other point, so x1 equals negative 1, so there's a switch, right? It's, it becomes this. So using this space, it's easily separable. <laughs> you just can easily solve it and just make this mapping. <coughs> All right. All right, there is one in interesting ob observation for, for people who use a support vector machine. Is that um, when you take a look at this, right, when, when, when you see your original optimization problem, as we said before, I just write it down, it's like this. So we try to optimize this functional, so i, j, uh, lambda i, lambda j, uh, y, i, y, j, x, i, transpose x, j subject to the 
It's no positive, no negative, right? And the solution, the, the linear discriminant, the discriminator, linear discriminator, is works like this. So y equals to So what's in the parentheses is, is, that, is that weight function, remember, right? It's the combination of your inputs, vectors. Plus <coughs> B. When you observe is that when you do this linear mapping, right, you map to a different space. Then in the, in the new space, you do exactly the same, right? So, so what you have is basically When you express, when you have a, a nonlinear mapping in a new space, when, when you express the problem in the original space, it looks like that. It looks like this lambda, same i, j, lambda i, lambda j, y i, y j. So here is that nonlinear function of x transpose nonlinear function of x i, x j. So what's here to show you is that this x means it's a vector, right? You have a set of nonlinear function, so your x is mapped to this vector, right? Your x vector mapped to another vector. It may, it may, it may not be the same. It could be go to a higher dimensional space. It could be the same space, right? So this is just your new your new variable, right? So, and your linear discriminant, now it's nonlinear, it looks like that. So it's uh, lambda i, y i, uh, Right, you, ju you just basically just you just place that your vector x, we use your data, we are variables by the corresponding whatever nonlinear function you have in, the, in, the, in the, the new variable you have. So if you observe that, you see that the function I want to optimize here, right, and the final result linear discriminant, it always has this product term like this. This is dot product, right, inner product of two vectors. So you, you don't really need to explicitly say what the, your nonlinear mapping function is, right? But it's an, it didn't show up in the final results, right? So they call this the kernel. It's defined as this, so it's the x, say, with another z, that's x, say, prime, uh, just this. It's just a scalar, right? Oh, sorry, just x prime, like this. So it's t people typically find this by sort of zero, zero, how do you choose these functions? How do you choose them? I mean, people would say, okay, you can choose polynomial or Gaussian, right? So Gaussian could radio basis function, it's a Gaussian function. Polynomial would be this sort of like, Maybe so some kind of power function. The polynomial, uh, the Gaussian would be something like this. Depend on the distance between the two. Sorry, this is absolute divided square. And so, right. so how is this related to what we had before? I think. <coughs> If you go back to the multilayer perceptron again, so we, we see what's the, what's the relationship. So if you consider a multilayer perceptron, we say it's very powerful. You can perceive any function. I just draw a network. Suppose this is the final output, right? So these are the inputs from here. 
my input vector goes to here, and do this nonlinear nonlinear transformation. So all, each of the neurons, we said it before, it has a sigmoidal gain function with some kind of non-atomic increment function. So the standard sort of hyperbolic tangent function, where a lot of people use this sort of Schrödinger linear function, is basically x sub zero and x. Sorry. It turns out this has good generalization ability for many problems. So this is very, you know, it's a universal function. It's a universal function approximator. If I look at the final stage of the output y, you see, okay, it is. At this stage, it's actually a linear combination of something. So this is uh, this is uh, final weight, weight two weight, and so on, right? So what you have is that f whatever it is, this function, the output from this unit, it depends on many other things. It is some kind of nonlinear function, right? Which we can write this the final y is a linear combination, uh, the y the linear combination of something. So it's a w. Sorry, it's w. Of some function, nonlinear function that depend on your input x, right, linearly combined. Right. So, when you go back to here for the support vector machine, after the nonlinear transformation, the general formula, the formula that you look at this y, right? It depends on all these things that depend on the data, right? So, what doesn't depend on it is just this thing here, this vector, right? Whatever it is, you can write this support vector machine as some kind of, we write here, it is some kind of a function that depends on this, it's a, it's a linear combination of some bunch of functions, right? This function, of course, is these, whatever you, you use here. All of these depend on data, it's just numbers. So what you have is some you know, nonlinear function, <laughs> you combine them, that's, that, that's your discriminant function, right? So, so you see, so and the choice of these linear things for the first supervised machine, that's one problem with this uh, supervised machine, that you don't know which function to pick. It depends on the problem, right? You can pick the right one or the wrong ones, the, the appropriate ones. Uh, if compared with this, is that the final result will be the same. You have some you know, linear combination with some nonlinear functions, right? Here, the same thing if you go to the last stage. So, but these things, uh, these nonlinear function here in the, in the multi-layer perceptron with a deep network, it's just learned from experience. Right? You, you, bu you build up some complex representation based on some simple function like these, some monotonic increment function. You linearly combine them, you go to the next stage, it's nested, the same function nested. Eventually, you, you have linear combination with some bunch of function, but these can be, can be learned. All right. So that in other words, it's, the support vector machine always works if you have some nonlinear function already, if you found some nonlinear function. Then for the last stage, you want to linearly combine them, the support vector machine would be a good way to combine these things, right? Because you have the maximum mar like a margin. Uh, you know, and, and for these kind of uh, single units, like a you know, unit like this, a monotonic increment function, you can only do linear discrimination, right? The reason is that, let me see, because just like a neuron, it receive a bunch of inputs. Your output is always uh, some gain function, some weights times your inputs, right? Let's linearly combine them. We have a threshold, we have a bias. But the nonlinearity here, it doesn't change the ordering of your inputs. So if you want to say the f output is higher than than something with one class, lower is another class. So what really matters is the value of this thing inside, right? That's still a linear function, right? So this kind of function, even at nonlinearity, doesn't make it <laughs> For, for a single, single unit level, it's, it's still a linear discriminant function. All right. With that, I think, uh, I think that's all for today's lecture. So I'm going to give you a whole more link like later, later today. Right. Uh, any, any question? Okay. All right. Thank you.